Hi guys, welcome back to the desktop for another rules breakdown. And this week we're going to be covering Starblazer Adventures from Cubicle 7 and it came out in 2008. Now this uses the Fate rule system, which I don't believe I've covered in the past. So this is going to be a first. And it uses a weird system where you're adding and subtracting your dice, but we'll come to that in a second. Now, as usual, we need a sample character, and the sample character we're looking for is on page 609, so way back at the back of the book. And it's a Star Patrol Galactic Police Officer here. So we'll be using that, and let's have a look at the rules. So skills are dealt with on page 21, but we'll come to that in a second. Basically, they work from these ranking systems. So we've got various ones, legendary down to average. Now, the way these skills work is that you have to have at least one extra skill on each level below. So to have one skill at plus three, you need to have two at plus two and three at plus three. Always one more. So you can have any number at plus one as long as you have one less on plus two and then at least one less on plus three. If you can have plus eight, you need to have bought a lot of skills up to levels below that. Now, the way it works is you're rolling one good dice and one bad dice. So I've chosen a green and a red to indicate that our green is good, our red is bad. And we roll those, and the green adds to our skill roll, and the red takes away. So we've got minus four. So let's say the character here was trying to use his technology skill. So he's got plus two on that, it's a fair skill. So He's rolled minus four, so he's got minus two. So he's failed the task. One of the big points in the fate system, funnily enough, is the fate points. So skipping to page 22, we've got the description of the fate points here. You may spend one fate point to do several things after you have rolled the dice. You can add plus one to any of the dice roll, to the total of the, any dice roll. So... He could have taken that minus two that he's got there to a minus one. To power a stunt that is particularly powerful. To make a minor narrative declaration in the game outside of rolling dice. The storyteller has veto power over this. Invoke an appropriate aspect which lets you add plus two to the dice roll or re-roll the dice. Tag an aspect belonging to the scene or another character. So, we can see the aspects this character has here. Well, he's technology, he's trying to find something out or trying to do something with technology, and one of his aspects here is make do with anything. So he invokes that by spending a fate point and gets a plus two. So that would actually take his roll up to zero. Still a fail, so still not worthwhile making, but that's how it works. You invoke your fate points and you can uh, bring in your aspects. Now that costs you one fate point, so you go down. Um, or the Games Master can invoke them, which gives you a fate point to spend later. So he might turn around and say, you've got stretched resources. You know, your supplies aren't enough. So he can invoke it and cause you problems, but you will gain a fate point to use later. But let's say the character had rolled far better. Let's say they would rolled a three and a six. They're using their skill, so they've actually gained five. Well, first of all, the Games Master would have assigned a difficulty to the task. So it would have said you needed to get two. So with plus five, you've easily made it. But the extra points are called shifts. And shifts can do things. If we turn to page 213. Using shifts. Basic uses for one shift includes reduce time required. Increase quality of outcome. Increase subtlety, make the job harder to take by one. So, not only have you succeeded in the task, but it didn't take you as long, or you did a better job, or nobody noticed you doing the job. You were sneaky about it. So that's how it works. You're trying to get your target number with your invoking of your skills and spending any fate points if you want to. And if you get extra levels, you can improve how well you succeeded by spending the shifts. It's also worth bearing in mind spin. If we turn to page 231, we've got spin. In its broader sense, spin is a special effect that occurs when a character scores a significant or better success, three shifts or more. That special effect may simply be color. 
It may mean the character looks particularly cool or is due some recognition for excellence. However, in some cases, gaining spin can result in actual game effect. But when you're spending spin, it's taking away those shifts. So it mentions here on defense. Spin is used in effect occurs instead of overflow. For example, when someone generates succeed on defense by three shifts, so they're defended and they're not going to take any damage, but they have extra shifts, which they don't need. It generates spin. Now you can use your spin to give someone else a plus one bonus so they can attack better or defend better. Or you can keep those shifts as overflow, using it later to dive clear of an impending explosion or some other supplemental action. Initiative is dealt with on page 215. And basically it tells you you use the alertness skill, but you're not actually rolling it, you're just going from lowest to highest. So if we go back to our character, oh, I forgot to keep my fingers in the page. Here we go. We look down his skills and he does not have alertness skill. So he has got plus zero on it. So anybody with an a skill of plus one, plus two, plus three is going to go before him. And it's going to go in that order from the highest alertness skill down to anybody who's got zero at it. So combat's dealt with on page 216. And it details through different types of actions. But basically what you're doing is you're looking at this table. So you're trying to wound or kill someone. So you're using fists, guns or weapons. Defenders can use fists, athletics, or weapons, so they can try and dodge out of the way or they can counterattack. And we've got rules here for deceive, if they're trying using deceit skill and someone can use resolve or empathy to resist. Scare, they use intimidation and resolve to resist. Charm, force movements, etc. But basically we're doing a contested skill roll against the attacker's skill and the defender's. So, the attacker here. We'll use the character. We will say that his arms officers sounds like a decent skill to use. It sounds relevant. So it's a plus three. So we pick up our dice and we roll. Double one, he gets zero. So he actually has plus three. So he has three, a result of three. And the defender will say they're using the same skill. So they roll, they get a one and a four, some minus three. So their attack is taken to zero. So the attacker wins with plus three. And damage. Well, we've got a section here on resolving attacks on page 219, 220. It all details it. But basically, there is no detail for weapon damage. Doesn't really matter because this is a story game. So the plus three that they've received, the shifts there, convert straight across to damage. So that's how it works. You, whatever shifts you obtain on your attack roll over the defender to convert directly to damage. But what does that actually mean? So we flip back to the character sheet and we can see that the character has physical stress and composure stress under their status box here. Physical stress is for combat, you know, when you're being shot or punched or whatever. Composure stress is for social, you know, when you've been bargained with and humiliated because you failed so bad or whatever. But this was a combat, we were shooting at each other. So we've got three boxes of physical stress. Now you can see he's only got eight boxes. So that's a significant hit just for one attack. But we can do something with that with consequences. Flicking back to page 220, we've got consequences here. Now you can take a minor consequence, reducing the, stress, the hit by two stress. Major consequence, reduces the hit by four stress. Severe consequence, reduces the hit by six stress. Extreme consequence, reduces the hit by eight stress. Now, a minor consequence might be you've been hit and your nose has been bloodied. Now, that has no effect because you're going to wipe that blood away pretty soon. But anybody encountering you very rapidly is going to see you've been in a fight. So it might have consequences before that. You're going to be recognized as somebody who's been hostile. Um, major consequences will be something more similar, uh, larger. You know, your weapon's been knocked out of your hand. You'll have to retrieve it. Or similar things. Your weapon breaks. Severe consequences, you've broken an arm. Extreme consequences, you're going to receive a scar of some kind. These are going to be effects which take much longer. Now, when you're taking consequences, you can only take one of each. So, while it might seem sensible to build these up and only use them when necessary, 
perhaps you'll only ever need to remove the consequences of minor ones, but you'll be losing more severe types of consequences because you've already used the lower types. But when you finally run out of consequences and you run out of physical stress, you've been taken out. If a character takes a hit which takes him past an extreme consequence, that character is taken out. The character has decisively lost the conflict, and unlike the other levels of consequence, his fate is in the hands of his opponent, who may decide how the character loses. The outcome must remain within the realm of reason. Very few people truly die of shame, so having someone die as a result of a duel of wits is unlikely, but having them embarrass themselves and flee in disgrace is not unreasonable. So losing a combat isn't necessarily death. It can be something else. First, the effect is limited to the character who has been taken out. The victim may declare that the loser has made an ass of himself in front of the Admiral, but he cannot decide how the Admiral will respond. Second, the manner of the taken out result must be limited in the scope of the conflict. After the victor wins a debate with someone, he cannot decide the loser concedes his point and gives him all his money. The effect must be reasonable for the target. People do not normally explode when killed. That cannot be taking someone out. Similarly, a diplomat at a negotiating table is not going to give the victor the keys to the Empire. And when you're healing up consequences, after combat's by, you've got consequences. Minor consequences are removed any time the character has a few minutes to sit down and take a breather for a few minutes. So as I said, you've received a bloody nose. When you've got a moment, you wipe that blood away. Major consequences for a character to get a little more time and distance. Depending on the type of major consequence, they remain in place until the character has had the opportunity to take anything from a few hours of downtime up to a few days. Severe consequences may require substantial downtime, measured in a week to a few weeks. And extreme consequences generally put characters in accident and emergency, in jail, in the nearest rehab, perhaps on their death board or fried within a micron of their life. So the consequences build up and take an associated longer time to heal. So character advancements dealt with on page 244 and 245. And it's a little different to any other role-playing game I've seen. Because character advancement starts at the start session start. At the start of every game session, apart from the first one, the storyteller should award every player a skill point. So you can add a new skill at plus one, or you can save those points to later and buy a higher level skill. Remembering, of course, you need to have one more skill at each level below. So to have a level three skill, you need to have two level twos, three level ones. You can replace an aspect. So you decide that you don't like the best damn pilots in the galaxy and you swap it out for best damn gunman in the galaxy or something like that. Change an aspect. So you can change one of them based on what's happened. So in an adventure, he gets lots of resources. So his stretch resources becomes extensive resources. He just modifies it slightly. You can swap to adjacent skills. So he decides actually... With his best damn gunman in the galaxy, he's going to be using that aspect. He doesn't really want his arms to be his best skill anymore. He swaps it with a lower skill. So he swaps it with his arms fleet. So he's actually better at shooting when he's on a starship. You can swap those round free of charge. You can change one stunt. Well, this character doesn't have any stunts. But it goes into more detail on how stunts work here and how you can add them. We've got at the end of an adventure as well. You can add a stunt. As I said, it mentions about adding them there. Add aspects. So we've got adding aspects. It explains here. But basically you can have more aspects than your stunts and refresh. So he's got a refresh of 10. So he can have 10 aspects. And you add one to your maximum refresh. So at the end of the adventure, he gains one refresh. It also mentions that at group milestones, so when something notable has happened, the Games Master can do something, so like, everybody gets spent 10 skill points. The group gets a new or bigger starship, or you just open a bottle of champagne around the game table, because real-world incentives work. So that's how advancement works. You've got to, of course, remember that you need to have the more skills on the lower levels than up. So buying skills, you'll often be buying lots of low-level skills first to be able to earn the higher-level skills. By the time you've got to a legendary, you need to have to have one legendary skill. You need to have two epic, three fantastic, four superb, five great, six good, seven fair, and at least eight average skills to make the pyramid going up to having your one legendary skill. So that is Starblazer Adventures and the Fate System. 
I really like the way it creates a collaborative form of gaming where you're working with the games master to build the story together, adding lots of elements from the players and everybody's describing what's going on. Really nice system that way. It's perhaps not as crunchy as some systems I like, but this could be a whole load of fun and I really, really like it. Anyway, I think I've witted on for quite long enough, so thank you very, very much for watching. As always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.